Greek New Testament Sentence Diagramming. This is part eight of our how-to series. As always, we'll begin with some review. I have quite a number of review slides this time. I won't talk much about them. You can be ready on your pause button if you need to stop and look at some of these slides a little longer than I show them. A new symbol from part five was the series symbol showing how we set up coordinate series of items. You see the light blue color to show the series. In part six, we learned about the appositive. Again, the light blue color shows the appositives, and you notice the equal sign connecting the appositive to the word that it renames. We also had quite some discussion about how to distinguish between an attributive and an appositive, since these are often so similar. We expanded our coverage of the series symbol by showing quite a variety of paired conjunctions. You'll notice pairs of conjunctions in light blue in a coordinate series symbol showing how those pairs work together. Sometimes there's no conjunction at all. And then sometimes we can set things up in subseries. Here you see a subseries of two at the bottom of the larger coordinate set. Here you see that same set set up as two subseries, a subseries of four at the top and two more at the bottom. In part seven, we learned about adverbial clauses. They supply modifying information about some other verb in the sentence. Here you see two adverbial clauses introduced by conjunctions, modifying the imperative apan gelate. We also learned about the adverbial participle. That same sentence has two adverbial participles, each shown in the light blue color. Notice the right angle modifier shelf that's used for the adverbial participle. That will figure into our discussion of this video's new information. So let's learn a new symbol for this video, just one, the genitive absolute participle. Now the genitive absolute is a construction that many students have difficulty with, and so we're going to have to spend a fair amount of our time in this video just making sure that we understand what that construction is. Once we understand clearly what it is, then how to diagram it will follow pretty naturally and pretty easily. We're extending here our discussion of the adverbial participle to this special construction called the genitive absolute. In this construction, the adverbial participle's referent is not a member of the governing clause at all. A participle's referent is the word or the concept or person referred to within the passage that functions kind of like the participle subject. If it's an action verb, the referent is the thing that does the action. At the same time, since the participle is a verbal adjective, it's also a word that modifies its referent. So there's an interesting kind of a bilateral relationship between the participle and its referent. I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along. In the genitive absolute, the special situation is that the participle's referent is not a member of the governing clause at all. Again, this will become a little clearer as we go along. Since the participle's referent is not a member of the governing clause at all, it has no grammatical function that dictates its case. In Greek, the way a noun or an adjective's case is determined is by its function within its clause. But the referent of the genitive absolute participle has no function within the clause, within the governing clause. Its only function is in relation to the participle. But the reference gender, number, and case don't depend on the participle. The participle's gender, number, and case depend on the referent. So we have to get the referent into a certain case before we know what case to write the participle in. So this is a bit of a dilemma. The Greek convention for resolving this dilemma is to put that referent in the genitive case. If it were in the nominative case, there would be potential confusion between the participle's referent and the subject of the main verb. So to avoid that confusion, Greek goes to the genitive case for the participle's referent, and then the participle will be written in gender number case agreement with that referent. And the term for that construction, as I've been saying, is the genitive absolute. In the term genitive absolute, that word absolute has a special technical meaning. It means disconnected, isolated, standing alone. So it doesn't mean dogmatic or inflexible. That's not the meaning of the word at all in this context. 
The genitive case in this construction, rather than the nominative, is used to signal that the referent is disconnected from the governing clause. That referent is not in the genitive because it has a normal genitive case relation like possession to something in the governing clause. Instead, it's functioning as the subject of a verb form, that participle, but instead of being in the nominative as most subjects are, it's placed in the genitive to signal a disconnection from the governing clause. That's the only reason for the genitive case here. And so that's where the term genitive absolute comes from. It's the genitive case used to isolate that word from its governing clause. Now, all of this is probably about as clear as mud if you don't already understand these things. And so we need some examples to bring some clarity to the discussion here. So we're going to start with some conceptual examples in English. Here would be a simple adverbial phrase. Having come to the temple, there's our adverbial participle phrase, having come to the temple in the light blue color there, here's the main clause, Jesus rejoiced. Of course, the meaning is something like when he came to the temple, Jesus rejoiced. But I've used a simple participle form in English, having come, in order to approximate the Greek structure as closely as I can. Now, I've been talking about the participle's referent. What would the referent be for the participle having come? Well, who does the coming? Jesus does. So the participle agrees with Jesus, who in that Greek sentence would be masculine, nominative, singular. Masculine, singular, intrinsically, and nominative because he's functioning as the subject of the verb. So the participle in Greek would be written in the masculine, nominative, singular, in agreement with its referent. Now let's look at a genitive absolute participle phrase for contrast. The crowd having come to the temple, Jesus rejoiced. Now who does the coming? Jesus isn't the one who does the coming. The crowd does the coming. But what function does the word crowd have in the sentence? Its only function is as the subject of that participle having come. But to be the subject of a participle does not require a Greek word to be in any particular case. The agreement works the other way around. The participle's referent has its case determined by its function in the sentence, and then the participle is written in agreement with that. The word crowd has no function in the sentence except to be the subject of that participle. So what case would it be in? Well, if it were in the nominative case, as you begin to read that sentence, you would think that crowd is going to be the subject of an ordinary verb coming later, but that's not the way it works. So crowd is placed in the genitive to signal that it's not going to be part of the governing clause. And then when we see the participle following it in the genitive case, then we have the two pieces and we realize, oh, this is a genitive absolute construction. When the crowd came to the temple, Jesus rejoiced. And in the Greek mind with the Greek grammatical conventions, all this flows very smoothly. So, no grammatical connection dictates the Greek case of the crowd. The Greek convention is to put that word into the genitive, then the participle agrees with it. It's masculine, since oklos is a masculine noun. It's genitive, and it's singular. That's the genitive absolute. Now, let's put this into Greek so we can see it operating in Greek terms. Here we have it again in English, the simple adverbial participle phrase, having come to the temple, Jesus rejoiced. Here's how that would look in Greek. Proselphone is the participle, written in the masculine singular nominative, agreeing with ha Jesus. Now you may look at the ending on proselphone and say, that looks genitive plural to me. Well, yes, genitive plural words do end in omega nu, but the genitive plural form of this participle would be proselphantone. And this is why in Greek you have to learn whole word forms and not just endings, because in Greek there are various forms that can share the last few letters without being the same form at all. So this is the masculine nominative singular form of that second aorist active participle. All right, what would a genitive absolute look like? The crowd having come to the temple, Jesus rejoiced. Okay, here's the crowd in the genitive case, to aklu. Then the agreeing participle, pros alphantos. And there again, you may look at that last two letters and say, that looks nominative to me, like anthropos. Well, yes, it happens to have the same last two letters as anthropos. But the whole ending is pros elthantos. That antos ending is a third declension genitive singular ending. So that is in agreement with the participle aklu. To aklu pros elthantos is the genitive absolute. The crowd having come to the temple, Jesus rejoiced. I might have put uh, tohi ro, the dative to the temple in blue in these examples as well. But I used the blue just for the participle construction part of the sentence. So the standalone adverbial participle is the only word in blue in the first example. For the genitive absolute, there are two parts to the construction. So we have both the noun, to aklu, and its participle, pros elthantos, in blue, to just keep a narrow focus on the central components of that genitive absolute construction. I left the modifier tohi or ro 
uh, in normal text. All right, so how will we diagram the genitive absolute? What will the symbol look like? First, let's talk about the simple adverbial participle. We covered it in our review a moment ago. It goes on just a simple right angle modifier shelf, like so. Now here we have the genitive absolute phrase. How could we modify that adverbial participle diagramming symbol to accommodate the whole genitive absolute construction? Well, we'll need that right angle modifier shelf, won't we? Because the genitive absolute is an adverbial participle. But how will we work the subject into the symbol? Well, that won't be too difficult. We'll just lengthen that horizontal line and we'll introduce a subject verb divider, a vertical line extending below that horizontal line. We'll write the subject to aklu on the left side of that divider, the participle pros elthantos on the right side of that divider, pretty much like it was a regular baseline. But what about the fact that this is genitive absolute? There's supposed to be a kind of a disconnection here. Uh, what I've just described, if you were to try to read the diagram in an ordinary way, you'd see the verb. And then beneath that verb, the first thing you would encounter on that modifier we're building is this genitive noun, to aklu. And it would look like it should be a genitive case modifier for the verb. But the genitive is not used with a normal grammatical connection there. The genitive is used to disconnect this absolute construction from the main clause. And so we can show disconnection by using a dotted vertical line segment rather than a solid one. And that will give us a clearer picture of what's happening here. We realize now that we see this symbol. As soon as we see that dotted line, we know that this is not an ordinary modifier. This is the genitive absolute consisting of the subject to aklu and the genitive case participle pros elthantos. So here's our genitive absolute symbol, our one new diagramming symbol for this video. Now let's look at biblical examples. Matthew 26, 47, and he still speaking, which is a little awkward sounding, we would phrase it more smoothly, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12, came. Before I actually show you this diagram, let's think through and see if you can envision it, or perhaps even sketch it out as I speak. For the main clause, and you always start with your main baseline, you have the subject and verb, Judas came, Judas eilthen. Now there are some introductory words here. There's a conjunction, Kai, at the beginning, and Judas came. There's also an interjection, behold, Judas came. In part four of this series, we covered introductory conjunctions and interjections. So those will need to appear at the left end of the baseline. We also have an appositive here, don't we? Judas, one of the 12. So one is an appositive, Hase is an appositive renaming Judas, and it has a modifier, ton dodica, of the 12. So that will have to be worked in, and that will give us the main clause. Then we can diagram the genitive absolute, which includes eti, still speaking. Eti is a modifier for speaking, and autu is the subject of that genitive absolute phrase. So can you picture that genitive absolute construction I've just described as a modifier for the main clause? Well, here's what it all looks like. Does your eye go right to the center of that baseline, Judas came, to find the core of the sentence? And do you see the chi and the idu as introductory conjunction and interjection? Do you see one as an appositive renaming eudos and then ton dodica as modifying one, one of the twelve? And then the genitive absolute in light blue, he speaking, while he was speaking. And then la luntas has its modifier eti, while he was still speaking. So there's our diagram for that sentence. All right, here's another one. This is the Jewish leader's instructions to the Roman soldiers about the story they're to tell about Jesus' resurrection. They're to say, his disciples, having come at night, stole him, we sleeping, which sounds very awkward, that we sleeping, but the idea is while we were sleeping. Okay, can you envision the diagram again? His disciples stole him, will be the main clause. Uh, a simple participle phrase, having come at night, okay, having come is going to be a participle agreeing with disciples. Masculine nominative plural. So we have both a simple participle and a genitive absolute. His disciples having come at night stole him. We sleeping. Can you see that the we has no grammatical function in the main clause? His disciples having come at night stole him. There's no room in that main clause for the we referring to the soldiers. So hemon is genitive absolute. The disconnected genitive. And then the participle, koimomenon, agrees with it, masculine, nominative, plural. All right, so can you picture that in diagram form? Here's what it looks like. His disciples stole him, is the main clause. Having come at night, 
Now that word nuktas grammatically actually could be a modifier for eklepson. His disciples came and stole him at night, but I have not found any English versions that translate it that way. They all seem to connect it with elthantes, so that's the way I've diagrammed it as well. Nuktas modifies elthantes. It tells when they came, and elthantes is the simple adverbial participle in this sentence. Then hemon koimomenon is the genitive absolute construction. Uh, hemon in the subject slot, koimomenon in the verb slot, overall in that right angle modifier shelf that's used for adverbial participles with the dotted vertical segment to show that it's the absolute construction. All right, you're ready to go in diagramming genitive absolutes now. Happy diagramming!